<clears throat> that was a very nice video. Um, first time I saw this. It saves me a lot of time at the intro. My name is John Metzler, um, and I want to welcome you all to this um, uh, webcast by the Conference Board, courtesy of the Conference Board. Um, I am the, um, the co-leader, together with Rita Shore of the Innovation and Digital Transformation Institute for the Conference Board, and I am thrilled to be introducing to you a report which the Institute has been working on for quite a while now. Um, and this is the official launch of the of the report. We've already you know, published it, um, but we want to go and take time to engage you in it. Um, and please do so. We want to make this as interactive as we possibly can. Realizing the full potential of digital transformation. Um, I want to start off by, um, by doing something which, um, oops, one time, sorry, it was too fast. It, was, it went a bit slow. By doing something which I learned in one of my first presentation courses. Tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and tell them what you told them. <laughs> Um, so um, we're going to go and tell you four key insights, give you four key insights. Uh, digital transformation is more about, um, is less about digital, but more about transformation. Um, that mistake is, uh, is still made very often. People fall in love with the technology rather than what it can do for business and, and organizations. Um, this is where this becomes so interesting, I think, what we've done. You know, the conference board has got connections with all these large corporations and its leaders. Um, and we're going to go and present you real stories here, learnings and insights from a uh, few Fortune 500, I hear an echo, Fortune 500 and beyond practitioners. Is everything okay? Let me see here. Am I doing well? Um, oh, sorry, I heard an echo. Um, uh, we're going to tell you three core insights which we, which we extracted on how digital becomes a transformation and then five supporting competencies. Um, so that's the, uh, the content uh, for today. Uh, the presenters, um, you see me, but I'm not interesting. Um, let's focus on Charles Popper, you know, who was a, a co-program director of the CIO Business Council, very experienced uh, um, uh, digital transformation leader um, and, uh, and working with the Commerce Board for several years. And he's joined today by Chanda Ballou, um, who is one of our newer um, acquisitions, associate professor at the Institute for Manufacturing Department of, of, Department of Engineering at the University of Cambridge and a senior fellow now of the conference board. Um, one thing I still need to tell you apparently, what wasn't in the nice uh, intro video, is uh, CPE. Um, you can get uh, you can get your CPE credits um, by uh, uh, getting to the right pod uh, at the bottom right corner. Um, you got to stay online. You got to be watchful for three pop-ups, and then um, it's only for you who are in this live webcast, not for those who are going to see the webcast later on on demand. Um, which should be speaking for itself to some degree. With that, let's get into the matter at hand. Um, and, uh, and I want to introduce to you the report and the insights. Um, I also want to tell you that uh, Ch Charles and Chandler were not the only contributors to the report. Um, Sean Hicks, uh, who, has, who has left the conference board um, for New Pastures uh, recently, um, has been a, a huge contributor. Um, and so has Janet Howe. Um, the senior economist uh, at Innovation and Intangibles, who's, uh, who's part of our Innovation and Digital Transformation in Institute. Um, for now, I want to hand it over to Charles. Charles, take it away, please. Thank you, John. Uh, just before we get into it, I, I wanted to explain a little bit about the methodology of our study. Uh, the study was conducted via a series of interviews. We interviewed executives in, in the digital transformation area of 14 companies across a whole variety of industries. There was a defense, uh, semiconductor, consumer products, financial services, healthcare, manufacturing, so it, uh, high tech. So it's a whole group of companies. So we, the idea was to learn about behaviors that were not industry specific, but were across industry. So, and, and those interviews were conducted um, 
in, in depth with, with those 14 representatives. Uh, what, we typically start by talking about the productivity paradox. So if you look at the chart, you see that historically productivity growth was increasing. Uh, and somewhere in the mid 2000, 2005, 2006, it started uh, dropping. So the, this is the rate of growth, not productivity itself. Uh, but nevertheless, it was puzzling. And uh, we refer to this as the productivity paradox. Uh, and uh, the, the question is, what, what is it that despite the real significant investment in, in digital technologies, why was it that productivity did not continue to grow at, 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 the, same, uh, at the same pace? Um, and uh, that was one of the, the reasons we engaged in this research to see what we could learn about digital transformation and, and its impact on business outcomes and business value. Productivity is one measure of business outcome, but it, it's a fundamental measure of, of what your output is your, uh, of the business uh, divided by all the inputs. Uh, and the, the idea was to understand what one could do to create a better business outcomes uh, when one engaged in digital transformation. Uh, so uh, we also need to, uh, before we get into the study itself, define terms a little bit. So there's uh, three different terms that people use that we think are really different. Uh, digitiz uh, digitization, digitalization, and digital transformation. Uh, and you can see the words on the screen and, and read them. Uh, let me uh, illustrate them with, with a, s a simple example. In terms of digitization, turning your products into, into a digital uh, counterpart, uh, you can think about a publisher, a newspaper, a magazine, uh, that was typically in the past a print medium. It would print physical hard copy and, and distribute them. Uh, and at some point, almost every one of those went digital in the sense that it created a website it, or, and or a mobile app and it distributed content electronically. That's digitizing the product. Digitalization is digitizing the way you create the product. So even if you stayed with a newspaper or a magazine in hard copy, you can still digitalize the way you created it using digital electronic means uh, to do all of the, the uh, copy production, editing, formatting, uh, the, uh, the typesetting. All of that over um, decades became digital, even though the output was still the physical product. Now, of course, as you digitalize, you also enable the digitization of the digital product. But in, in a sense, you haven't really changed the business. You're still creating content and, and distributing it to, to your consumers. Digital transformation is when you think seriously about what the business model is that you're engaged in. How do you price out your product? You know, are you charging, um, uh, can you create premium services? Can you uh, have a variety of subscription services? So the way you relate to your, your consumers in, in terms of the business model, how you uh, generate revenue, uh, to what extent is the revenue model shifting from paying for content to advertising or vice versa? You know, those are all, key questions that relate to how effectively you've made this shift into the digital world. So that's digital transformation. So with that set of definitions, uh, let's move forward and, and understand what are the three main insights that we learned through these interviews. Um, and as we, we distilled all the information, uh, we realized that there are three fundamental areas where the companies that performed better in terms of creating better business outcomes they all engaged in this in some form or another. The first relates to your digital transformation strategy, defining what it is and, and making sure that in fact, the digital strategy is just an integrated part of the overall business strategy. It's not independent of the business strategy. We'll talk about each of these in detail momentarily. The second relates to the business model. That's the, the definition I just gave in terms of digital transformation uh, and the, uh, the, the ability to, to rethink from the from from basics, what the business model would be, and make sure that the new model really takes advantage of and leverages the, the new digital technologies. Chandra will speak about that, uh, and then the, the way you measure uh, your progress in in your in your journey towards digital uh, the digital world. Uh, we had some good learnings in terms of how you measure it, because as we all know, you can't manage anything that you don't measure. So the question is, what are the the measurement techniques that are relevant and and effective? to measure your digital transformation. So that in summary are the, the three major insights. Uh, and now let's focus on each of them. So digital uh, transformation strategy. What we learned from the, the interviewees is that having a, a, a digital transformation strategy in and of itself uh, made no sense. Just to say, I'm going to digital because the world is going digital. Uh, that, that for the most part is not relevant. But what we saw was that companies that had a coherent business strategy that, that leveraged new digital technologies did really well. Now, having said that, the business strategy should drive the digital uh, strategy. 
it doesn't really uh, answer the, the whole question because the business strategy can also be influenced by um, and, and, and founded upon digital technology. So you need to understand the potential of digital, trans, uh, digital technologies, what it means to your business, what it means to competitive biz, uh, businesses and, and understanding uh, how you can create a better business strategy through the use and leverage of these digital technologies. So it's, it's a two way street, uh, but at the end of the day, the, the two, uh, the business strategy and the digital transformation strategy need to be integrated. Couple of examples from the interviews. Uh, large semiconductor company uh, literally did not have a digital transformation strategy. Its business strategy uh, was was developed. Um, it was typically uh, enunciated in terms of a whole series of projects, um, uh, more than a dozen critical uh, projects that the company engaged in, and almost all of those projects required the use of some digital uh, technologies. So the, the digital transformation strategy was simply to make sure that the digital technologies were in place to enable the business strategy. Uh, so that's the, the but again, the, 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 the business strategies were certainly influenced by the availability of, of, of digital technologies. Uh, and they coordinated things through the chief technology officer who, who, and the chief architect who made sure that the digital technologies that were brought in by each of those business projects were consistent and coherent and, and they built on each other. So that was one example. A second example is a, a uh, consumer products company uh, in, in the cosmetic space uh, that had a fundamental strategy of getting closer to its consumers. Um, and in the beauty products space and cosmetics, um, you know, the, the primary consumers are women and, and they need to, uh, uh, to, to get access to, to the product. Typically uh, that is done through department stores and, and other outlets where the women can go in uh, there are beauty specialists to work with them, a very much in-person uh, experience. Uh, and their strategy of getting close to the, to the customer meant that they wanted to have more direct contact with the customer, not going through uh, the, the uh, distributors and, and the retailers. And they uh, understood that doing this digitally would be important. So they proceeded to, uh, to explore in an experimental way how you could uh, help women choose uh, cosmetics, hairstyle, um, uh, hair coloring, all kinds of products like that, and, and see visually uh, through uh, their e-commerce and mobile commerce technology what the, the products would look like uh, on, their, on, on them and, and uh, help them make those choices and, and turn that into, into sales. It turns out when you think about the, the COVID world and, and what we look forward to post-COVID, this is a critical investment that they made without knowing that, that COVID, this was done a year or two ago, uh, but it positioned them really well for the new world where department stores are going bankrupt. Uh, the ability for, for people to shop in person is limited. So the ability to do this kind of, of consumer uh, experience online uh, turned out to be a very wise investment. So again, the, the business strategy of getting close to the consumer was enabled by and driven by uh, the, the digital technologies that were becoming available. So that would be a second key example, but the list could go on. Uh, if you read the paper, you'll see a number of, of additional examples. But now let's proceed and, and let me turn it over to my colleague Chandra, who can uh, then talk about the next key learning, which is the business okay, model. Just one second, just one second. Um, uh, sorry, guys. Um, just one thing I want to re reaffirm, it was in the intro video, but maybe went fast. We want to make this interactive. At any time, please post your questions in the chat box and I'll weave them into the conversation. Um, we don't want to wait until the end of the presentation necessarily. We want to make this as interactive as we possibly can. And before you move on, can you go back one slide? Because I've got a question for you, Charles, on this one. Okay, one of the things which, which I, I always find is that the silos that we have in companies is one of the key reasons why it's so hard to go and, and integrate uh, digital information into the business strategy, right? I mean, I see, I see R&D doing its own thing on digital. I see the purchasing group is doing something else. I see, I see manufacturing doing its own thing. And IT is somewhere in the middle trying to go and get things together. Um, can you speak to that? Did you observe any of, of those kind of things? And how do you address that? Yeah, so actually that we'll, we'll get to the very end. One of the, uh, the good behaviors that we saw that was really critical is uh, the use of cross-functional teams and having that really fit into the culture of the companies. The, the companies that did this really well uh, f found it very natural to, uh, to behave in teams uh, and, and uh, to create these teams uh, in a very agile way when you had a, a new project that required different parts of the company to cooperate, team would form up. Uh, teams were measured as uh, basically in terms of the performance of the company so that you got away from the compensation systems that tend to 
reward individual behavior. Uh, here, the, the, the behaviors were all team behaviors and, and the, the rewards were only earned if the company itself did well. So the motivation was there to get people to work together. But that ability to do cross-functional teams and to make sure that everybody was lined up to, to really leverage this new idea, that was, that was a critical. And, and I, I, I guess that also requires sponsorship and, and leadership from very senior levels, no? Yes, yeah, you needed the, the uh, senior executives to be on board with that and, uh, and, and in, in a meaningful way. I mean, we've seen examples where in theory, one of the C-suite, even the CEO was behind an initiative, but if it wasn't pervasive across the C-suite, uh, those kinds of initiatives would often fail. So it, yes, the, the ability of, of leadership to be on board, to, to be consistent, to project that down so that everybody in the company understands what's going on, why we're doing this, why it's important uh, to make these changes. Uh, that, that cultural change is, is another very- So as your functional leader, elevate, elevate, elevate to make sure that you get your, your full business team aligned, um, your, your full C-suite aligned. Absolutely. And supported. Okay, thank you. Um, and we'll, we'll see this again in some of the other examples. Excellent, all right, Chandra. Chandra. Great. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Charles and, and John. Um, in, uh, just to follow up on what uh, Charles uh, had mentioned, uh, in a recent uh, C-suite challenge survey by the conference board of, of over 1,400 executives across the world, uh, covering multiple industries, uh, a simple question was asked in terms of what, what, what are the priorities in terms of remaining competitive by 2025? And it turns out that uh, a significant number of the C-suite executives put business model innovation very uh, significantly up their agenda. Um, it, it is clear that organizations need to move quickly to adopt digital technologies, not only to launch new products and services, but also to transform their business models in order to gain competitive advantage. So naturally, the question arises as to what do we actually mean uh, by business model uh, innovation. Uh, so first of all, to, to understand the concept of a business model, I like to use a very simple uh, uh, analogy, what I call the four Vs, i.e. asking ourselves what exactly is the customer value proposition, how is that value created and delivered, what's the means of capturing the value, what's the revenue and cost architecture, and what are the network of firms, what are the ecosystem of firms that are needed to work together in order to create the value and to deliver it? Now, in, in the, the notion of a business model ties up with the idea of a strategy. So strategy is all about contingent plan, i.e. what do you do when things around you change and what, which business models do you choose? The business model itself is the go-to-market strategy. How do you actually deliver the proposition? And once the business model is chosen, companies have an operating model that goes by functions in order to optimize uh, the particular business model that is chosen. And one of the, one of the key things, I think, uh, playing to the point that John had raised earlier, is the, the idea that digital technologies effectively enable for each strategy that's chosen, there's multiple architecture of business models that could be chosen. And for each of the business models that's chosen, there's multiple operational models that could be chosen, so to speak. So therefore, the complexity is quite high in terms of the relationship between strategy, business models, and the operating model. And as organizations grow, uh, the issue uh, that John highlighted just now is we tend to organize ourselves functionally because we want to optimize the business model. So therefore, the marketing unit or the R&D unit or the, H, uh, the production unit uh, effectively has a functional leader that tries to optimize the operations of that particular function. Now, in doing so, what happens in lot, lots of large organizations is the, the notion of the ownership to the business model gets lost. So therefore, when new digital technologies come on board, at each functional level, each function is optimizing their own operation by adopting the digital technology to improve the efficiency but therefore the ownership of the business model, i.e. who revisits and re-engineers or innovates the business model gets losses. And, and that's one of the big challenges that, that we face uh, in terms of uh, and aligning strategy, business models and operations and, and tactics that, that Charles had highlighted earlier. Now we have a, a number of examples of the challenges that firms um, have been facing and the opportunities in terms of digital transformation based on 
uh, the, the research that we did as part of the, the report. Uh, so for example, 3M Corporation, a, a large US multinational firm, um, uh, one, of the, one of the businesses they have is to sell uh, furnace filters. So to speak. Um, now, the, the 3M realized that actually customers don't necessarily want to buy furnace filters. What they want is clean air. So therefore, they decided to move to a servitized model. So effectively, uh, sensors are put into these filters uh, and the customer is charged a subscription and it's up to 3M to actually replace those filters as and when necessary uh, in order to ensure that clean air is provided to their customers. Now, it turns out that for such a servitization model to be effective, uh, the idea would be for 3M to uh, ensure that these filters are, are, are not changed too regularly, i.e. to service them in such a way that there's clean air provided, but you minimize the number of times that the furnace filters need to be changed. But if you look at how the manufacturing operations happen to work, uh, the manufacturing business or the unit is incentivized to reduce the cost of manufacturing, i.e. Uh, you know, you've got to scale up the manufacturing in order to reduce the cost. Uh, now, there is a mismatch here because on the one hand, the servitization models requires minimizing the volume of manufacturing, whereas the production function, the manufacturing operations is incentivized to increase the volume. And those are the kinds of uh, challenges that firms face in trying to transform uh, their, their business models using digital technologies. Yeah, uh, a second example is a... a Sorry, I just, yeah. I just find this example to be so telling. Mm. Why do we hear echo all the time? Um, anyway, I mean, fundamentally, what you do here is you take a manufacturing, you know, product company into a service company, right? Or at least one of the business units. I mean, that's a fundamental shift, right? Yep. 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 Yes. Yes. And I, I think that that is what uh, uh, a lot of these digital technologies enables companies to do. You are shifting away from a make and sell type model to a servitized model. But that is a fundamental shift requiring the whole uh, re-engineering of the underlying business models, the incentive structures, the, uh, the revenue and cost architectures, and the, and the value proposition to the customer. But if all of these elements do not change together, then firms struggle to make that particular transformation from a, a pure manufacturing firm to a servitized firm. And, and, and this, is, this is an example of it. Um, and, and moving on to our, our second, second example, um, it's a global uh, uh, car rental uh, business. Uh, now, it turns out that one of the important things if you're running a global car rental business is your customers want reliability. So whether you are a, uh, a tourist or a, a business customer, you, when, you, when you rent the car, you want reliability. Now, it so happens that um, the global car rental company had purchased, um, uh, had acquired a another car sharing company in order to enable its customers to rent cars uh, uh, on a shorter duration, i.e. by the hour and, and, and so on and so forth. Now, one of the things with the car sharing type model is the onboard telematics are, are pretty, uh, pretty sophisticated because the car sharing companies need to know when the customers are taking the cars, when are they returning it, and so on and so forth. Now, it so happens that the global uh, car rental company, uh, after having acquired the car sharing company, learned that one of the key uh, capabilities is the onboard telematics. Now, if they take those onboard telematics and put it into their regular car rental business, uh, they are able to predict uh, when the cars need maintenance and therefore be able to even pull the car out of service uh, after having rented it in order to prevent the cars from breaking down while in operation or while under rental, and therefore it improves the service quality of, 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 uh, of, of the proposition to the customers. Now, as a result of this, the, the, the company realized that, well, actually one of the key capabilities is to actually provide fleet management services, which wasn't a, a concept that the company has thought about, and therefore it's now building a new business model, which is using onboard telematics to build uh, fleet management services as a proposition uh, to, to the customers. The, the third example that we've got here is De Beers. So many of you know that De Beers is a, one of the leading global firms in the diamond industry. And they, they go right from mining, right to the wholesale uh, sales of diamonds to the retail sales of diamonds. Uh, and as a customer of uh, De Beers, one of the things that customers in the diamond industry are particularly concerned about is 
the genuineness of the diamond. So there is a lot of diamonds out there that are artificial diamonds and people tend to um, sell them as real diamonds uh, or, or low quality diamonds that people tend to push as high quality diamonds. Now, so in order to overcome this, what De Beers has been thinking about is how do I ensure the provenance of the diamond so that when a customer buys the diamond, they know the, the, the quality and the source and the originality of the diamonds. So therefore they've been working with the entire industrial chain. So this is where the value network comes in. So right from the time that the diamonds are actually mined, let's say in Botswana, uh, and then the diamonds are typically sent to London for a grading, they're sent to uh, Surat in India for cutting and polishing, and they may be sold to a customer in China. But in order to ensure that the customer knows the provenance of the diamond right from the time it is uh, mined to the time that it's sold, uh, De Beers have been working with a whole series of firms to build a distributed ledger or a blockchain technology to be able to trace the diamonds right through. Um, so that is the new value proposition, the new business model using digital architecture, but it requires working with a whole series of uh, ecosystem of firms in its industry in order to deliver that value proposition and transform uh, its, its, uh, its, its, its business model. So with that, I will uh, now pass on back to Charles. Thanks, Shonda. Um, and the next insight related to the way we measure progress along digital transformation. And, and one of the, the axioms of, of, of measurement is that uh, if you want to measure performance, you have to think about the inputs, the throughputs, and the outputs. We'll take each of these in turn. In terms of inputs, is what do you, how, how, do you, how do you make sure that you are ready for your digital transformation? What are the ingredients that go into it? And, and how do you measure your, the, the, the effectiveness that, of your preparation for that? Now, the conference board has done some research over the years in, in the broader space of innovation uh, and has uh, come up with what we call the signpost of innovation. John was actually very instrumental in some of that research. So as we talk about uh, the, the input side, um, let me, and we talk about the signpost of innovation, let me turn back to John to talk a little bit about what the signposts are and their application. Yeah, we find this a very powerful framework um, to go and, and guide how you measure um, overall innovation that leads to Fundamentally, ultimately, if you, look, if you look at the bullseye, business and financial outcomes. Um, and the way that we have uh, 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 seg segmented the innovation space is really when you take the vertical axis, you have the obvious areas of research and development, which is an, which is an input, but also understanding your customer and then also how the customer responds ultimately to your output in terms of your how your brand performs in the market. So being sensitive um, to what goes on in the marketplace, starting from sensing, and going and reading how you do as well in terms of uh, your you know, brand acceptance. When you move to the left, you see two um, important additional elements that you need to take into account for successful innovation. You've got to create an internal innovation culture, you know, where your people are on fire, you know, you, you create psychological safety and, and you, you engage your organization into, into your innovation, into innovation game. And it's never been more important than, than it is right now. Um, because of the, the very uncertain world that we live in where, you know, leaders don't have all the answers anymore and frankly often don't have any answers anymore and it, it requires fast experimentation um, and ultimately scale when it works uh, for you to go and develop those answers. That's not enough. You also need to be, and that's the top left uh, part, you need to be uh, in touch with your external ecosystems. You know, we need bigger solutions for the bigger problems that the world faces. You need to be able to work not only with your suppliers uh, or with your downstream partners, you need to work, learn to work with academia, governments, and so how do you create effective external ecosystems? When you then look at the, at, the, at the right side, you'll find two new forces that are feeding into that you need to be tapped into. Uh, the bottom uh, right is, uh, is making sure you're in touch with, uh, with environmental and social part of sustainability, right? The sustainability, three-legged stools got three legs, financial, environmental, and social. You got to go and make sure that you cover all of those in, in increasingly more equitable ways. Um, and the last force is then exactly, you know, making sure you are in touch with the digitization that's going on around us, and then feed that into your innovation game um, to make sure that that allows you to create innovation and ultimately business model innovation, as Chandra has explained so um, eloquently with nice examples earlier on. So a few, a, few sign, a few metrics in this digitization space would be things like mindset and governance. Is that, is that in, in, you know, in, in place? Your strategy, is it indeed linked to the overall business strategy? 
uh, your capabilities and you know, do you have your capabilities in place? Do you have your resources in place? And also, you know, ultimately, you can also look at uh, how does your adoption move forward? Look at the tangibles into your organization. So uh, we have written a report on this. It's available on our, on our you know, website um, if you want to study this more. We find this a, a very powerful framework to go and try to predict what is your innovation competence and capability that sets you up for ultimately business and financial outcomes through successful innovation. Back to you, um, Charles. Great, thanks. Yeah, actually, uh, there's a question that came in that maybe we can handle now. It's relevant to this, and that's, do we see anything uh, in, in the research in terms of the organization and to what extent you would embed digital experts into the business units to get the integration of strategy and, and the business model ideas that we talked about? And the truth is we did not see a, a definitive answer here. I, I think it's less about the pure organizational model of who reports to whom and more about the cross functionality, the, the culture that allows the, these kinds of ideas to move back and forth. So that uh, as long as the, the, the expertise is shared and the conversations go on and, and people are working together, we've seen good, good effect. But the, the, there's just organizing in a particular way doesn't necessarily make all those uh, conversations happen the right way. Uh, so moving on, uh, as, as uh, we talk a bit about throughputs and about um, the, the, um, the, the outputs, um, these, these are just some of the metrics that, uh, that we've seen that are, that are traditional metrics. And, and uh, the idea when we look at, at business outcomes, in the digital world, business outcomes don't really change. I mean, the, the, at the end of the day, business are all about uh, revenue and profit and margin and, and productivity. Um, and there are a bunch of reports that typically come out of all the systems. Uh, so these, these are still in place. And, and, and at the end of the day, we, we need to worry about them because this is what creates a, a successful business. Um, but in order to get there, it, it's really important to understand the throughput. So with that, let me turn back to Chandra. And um, I think, John, you want to, to get to the next slide? Yes, um, I, I, I'm able to. Uh, thank you, Charles. Um, so I think uh, in terms of measuring and managing uh, business model innovation, one of, one of the big challenges that firms face is the MIS reporting in most firms. Uh, I think the, the, my, my understanding is most uh, firms have an MIS reporting system that primarily focuses on profitability. So whether we look at the uh, customer relationship management system or the enterprise resource planning system or the manufacturing support system, or most other uh, systems within the firms, uh, they are effectively trying to measure the profitability of the organization, either at the firm level, at the business unit level, at the geographic level, or the product level. Uh, now, if you think about profitability, the principal uh, approach to measuring profitability is to match revenues that the firm is generating against the costs uh, that arises to, um, to, to generate that revenue. Uh, now, on, on the one hand, um, this is a very, very important aspect of managing a firm because the profitability effectively highlights to us whether the business is economically viable, whether we should be putting more capital in terms of growing the business and so on and so forth. Now, on the other hand, profitability reporting uh, has got some drawbacks. One of the drawbacks is it is not terribly conducive to think about business model innovation, primarily because it suppresses the activity system that is key part of a business model, i.e. effectively the, um, the, 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 the profitability reporting is matching revenues and costs, and the costs are matched regardless of where they arise. However, as we talked about earlier, the business model is a complex activity system that has got this four Bs, the value proposition, how the value is being created, uh, what are the value um, uh, network that firms need to work with, and what is the revenue and cost architecture. Now the profitability reporting system effectively suppresses the interaction of that activity system. And what we propose uh, as, as a means of, of improving the management of business model innovation is this notion of a business model coherence scorecard. And what we mean by that is effectively, it will be useful to have a coherent scorecard that, that measures the, the, the level of coherence, the level of balance uh, and the cohesiveness of different parts of these of the business model. The value proposition is the customer value proposition aligned to how the value is being created and captured. Is the, the value proposition aligned to the value network, i.e. the ecosystem of firms that are needed to create and deliver that value. 
is the customer value proposition aligned to the value capture mechanism, i.e. the revenue and cost architecture? Uh, so earlier we talked about 3M where there was a misalignment between what the business is trying to do in terms of servitization and the value capture mechanism and how the value is being created and, 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 and captured. And, and one of the key, key elements here, as we pointed out earlier, is the silo effect within firms means that as firms adopt digital technologies in order to improve the efficiency of parts of the organization, it can create more and more incoherence, i.e. the cohesiveness of the business model is being disturbed. And that is a, a, an issue. And most firms do not have a mechanism to actually report and manage such uh, incoherence or lack of cohesiveness of the, of the business model itself. And this is where we are proposing that a complementary reporting structure to profitability reporting, i.e. the business model cohesiveness scorecard, it will be required uh, in order to enable such business model innovation to take place. Now, one of the, I suppose there are three or four key elements to such a business model coherence scorecard. One is to ask ourselves, what is the physical flow are the raw materials and finished products and services delivered at the right time to the right place? Uh, what is the information flow within the organization and, 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 and beyond, i.e. within the ecosystem of firms? Is the information for decision making delivered to the right people or systems at the right time? Uh, what about decision rights, i.e. do the right people or systems have the authority to make those decisions? And what's the incentive system? Are, are people and organization are properly incentivized to make timely and joined up decisions? So, as, as new technologies get adopted, these questions need to be revisited. Right? The physical flow, the information flow, the decision flow, the incentive, uh, and the incentive system. And that is effectively what the business model coherence scorecard will try to report as a complementary set of information to uh, senior management. Uh, let, me, let me provide a simple example. Uh, a lot of us uh, have a washing machine at home. Um, and quite often, uh, if the, uh, the washing machine breaks down, uh, it could take anything between two days to six weeks to get a, the spare parts in. Now, why is that the case? Because uh, the spare part could be sitting in a different country uh, where the manufacturer is based, or it could be sitting with the retailer, uh, and it takes time for the retailer to get the, the parts uh, to, to, to be repaired. Now, imagine a world with uh, a combination of new technologies, such as distributed ledgers, uh, sensor-based technologies, um, as well as 3D printing, so additive manufacturing technology. Now, increasingly, uh, some of these washing machines are, big, are, are, are made smart, i.e. there are sensors in them that can detect when uh, a particular part in the washing machine is likely to break, break down. And therefore, it communicates to the manufacturer to say, well, this part is likely to break down. Can you actually uh, manufacture and send a part to be replaced? So to speak? Uh, now, if, imagine a world where some of these uh, technologies are embedded and we can imagine a distributed manufacturing model whereby the manufacturer doesn't hold the spare parts anymore, but lends the IP uh, through a blockchain technology or so to a third party 3D printing company that is very much closer to where the customer is. And as soon as the part is required, it's printed, it's replaced in the washing machine. The washing machine can actually test uh, using the sensor-based technology whether the part uh, conforms to the manufacturing standards and requirements and so on and so forth. Now that requires a complete transformation of the industrial architecture as well as the business model because there's no need to hold the spare parts anymore, but it is uh, a print, printed to demand, so to speak. Now imagine a world where the manufacturer, instead of moving to such a distributed model, merely replaces the current manufacturing process, which is a subtractive manufacturing process, with an additive manufacturing process, i.e. 3D printing, in order to reduce the amount of spare parts they need to hold. And they can, uh, they can print to demand as well. Now that requires, that effectively affects the distribution side of the firm as well as the procurement side. Because if you're going to print on demand, the entire the distribution and marketing of the manufacturing firm wasn't designed uh, to be able to deliver something on, based on printing on demand because it was it was based on uh, having stocks of, of the spare parts. Now, if we then extend that concept to the ecosystem of firms, i.e. the retailers and the repair shop and so on and so forth, there again, they were never built in order to be able to replace parts based on print on demand because it was a spare parts, parts based business model. So this is where there is, uh, there'll be an incoherent, i.e. the coherence of the business model within the firm 
as well as the ecosystem gets uh, misaligned. And if there is a reporting structure based on something like the business model uh, coherence scorecard, both within the firm as well as across the ecosystem, in order again to ask the questions around the physical flow, the information flow, the decision rights, and the incentive system, then it opens up a discussion both within the organization uh, about some of the strategic issues around business model transformation, as well as with the ecosystem of partners in order to migrate the industrial architecture to much more of a distributed uh, manufacturing model uh, that enables this type of new business models to arise. So that is a, a proposal uh, in terms of complementary information from product, uh, look, looking at profitability, complemented by business model coherence forecast, which will enable such business model innovation to take place. Thanks. So I'll pass it on to Charles. And before we move on, Chandra, thank you for all this wisdom. And indeed, it just reinforces how complex this all is and how important it is to getting it all together. Um, because it's hugely challenging, um, but also full of opportunities to get it right, right? Um, there is a, a down-to-earth question here, which is what does MIS stand for, but I got in the meantime addressed by the Central Management Innovation System. But then there's another question by Bernard, who's saying, are the components of the MIS reporting system you are describing made up of CRM, ERP, MSS, or other? Can you, does that ring a bell to you? I'm not very versed in this kind of non, you know, nomenclature. Are you? <laughs> Uh, right. So, am, am I? Uh, so, let me just go back to the slide. Um, so, uh, so uh, the, the 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 point of this slide is the, is the following. I, um, firms have a, a lot of reporting systems within the organization. I'm just giving some examples. These are CRMs, which which uh, tends to look at customers and who the customers are and the profitability of the customers and so on and so forth. Resource planning system is trying to uh, ensure that we understand the flow of information within the organization, uh, whether, it's, it's, uh, whether it is human resources or distribution and, and so on and so forth. So it's an enterprise resource planning uh, pro process. Manufacturing systems, again, are trying to uh, optimize the manufacturing processes. Now, what the, 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 the point here is all of these management uh, information systems, the MIS reporting systems, have got an underlying logic, i.e. it is trying to collate information so that it, it reports to management the profitability of the organization. And the profitability could be at different levels, i.e. you can look at it in terms of a product, i.e. Uh, particular, let's say it's a shoe manufacturing company and you're looking at the profitability of a particular shoe, or it can be by geography, i.e. you know whether Americas are more profitable than Asia, or it can be by business units. You've got a shoe manufacturing bit and you've got a socks manufacturing bit, how, how pro relative profitability is uh, uh, looking like. Or you can look at it at the firm level, i.e. how much capital do we need to grow this business and so on and so forth. So the, the, the point here is that's important, i.e. it is absolutely important because we need to understand as we run these organizations, how much capital do we need to put in? Are there sufficient return to the capital and so on and so forth? But in doing so, um, the, the, these reporting systems tend to effectively not look at the business in terms of business models, because we, when we define the business model, we are talking about what exactly is the value proposition, how the value is being created, which are the firms that need to be around, i.e. the network, what is the, 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 the value capture mechanism, and, and how are these interacting as a complex system in order to create and capture value for the organization. The reporting systems in most organizations do not uh, actually uh, structure the information in terms of the effectiveness of the business model. Uh, they are measuring the efficiency of the model by looking at profitability, but effectiveness is, are we doing the right thing? How are the interlinkages? Uh, um, uh, um, uh, how effective is one department's activity on other departments' activities, and so on and so forth. And this is where we are proposing that in addition to the current MIS reporting structures, we need a complementary reporting system that effectively captures the coherence, i.e. how balanced is the business model, how effective it is, are we doing the right thing, what are the areas in which the business model and the functions are conflicting with each other so that they can be re-engineered and therefore that acts as a means of innovating the business model. So that, that's the kind of point that we're trying to make here. That's I great. That Actually, Bernard's very happy with the answer, so that's good. Um, and thanks for that uh, enlightening. I have, an, I have another question coming in from Joseph um, my, my size, um, who says, um, one of the important areas that get missed in digital transformation is user experience. 
the area where digital and human interact, uh, be it end clients, partners, uh, and or employees. Once we enjoy a digital experience, this, uh, this sets the baseline bar for the next experience, absolutely, and digital adoption. Why don't we move, this is the, the, one of the, the question, one of the five competencies, right? We have 15 minutes left. Why don't we go and, um, and glide into the five competencies quickly? Yeah, actually, I was going to address that question on this slide, so I appreciate the, uh, the timely question. Uh, one of the, the throughputs that, that we typically look at is customer engagement. Uh, and this actually is a, an attempt to measure the, the user satisfaction with the customer experience. And we've seen examples um, in, in the study that, uh, of companies that, in particular in the digital world, have been able to instrument uh, their uh, technology so that they can actually measure the customer engagement. So, so on websites, uh, e-commerce companies will routinely look at the time on a page or how the, how the, the customer is, um, is experiencing what the customer journeys are through the different pages. Uh, but we've also seen uh, the, a really a great example of this in one of the high-tech companies, which can instrument its products and understand, uh, as it puts in new features, how effective the new feature is in enhancing or degrading uh, the customer experience um, and customer engagement. And they do this in real time, and, and they'll do it in the form of what you can call an A-B switch. If they have a million customers, they can give 100,000 of them uh, the new feature and not the other 900,000. And they can look differentially at What's, uh, what kind of different behavior does this new feature uh, create? Um, and is it a positive or a negative? And they can do this in real time. So the ability to see how effective the, the user experience is and whether it's leading you in the right direction or not is critical. And it's important to think about that as you create the technology to make sure that you've put in the instrumentation so you can take a measurement like that. So that's one of the throughputs that, that's really important to understand how effectively you're getting uh, you're working, um, and this becomes a good leading indicator for the business outcomes. If customers are more engaged, that will typically lead to more revenue and more profit, et cetera. So, uh, but it's an early indicator, and, and if you don't look at it until the, the quarter is closed, uh, it's kind of late to figure out uh, why, in fact, revenue is not what you expected. So again, appreciate that, that question. Um, and if we move forward, just to kind of recap again, the three learnings were about strategy, about business model, and about measurement. But as John said, let's move forward to the, the, uh, the competencies that, that we need. And there's kind of a build slide here. Let me just kind of get to all five of these and, and talk them through. Uh, we've talked a little bit about, uh, about customer um, centricity. That, that really is critical, that uh, in all of our businesses, the customer comes first. If you don't understand your customer and don't understand what delights the customer, uh, it's much harder to succeed. So, all of the, the work that we've seen that's effective is to make sure that the digital technologies reduce the distance between your company and your customer rather than increase the distance. And, and uh, the, the uh, global supply chains, as they've evolved, typically put many stages in between the manufacturer and, and the customer. And, and that has proven uh, to be uh, disadvantageous to the, to the manufacturers. It's harder for them to understand their customers. So figuring out how to use the technologies, especially the newer digital technologies to create to decrease that distance and increase the the, the ability to understand your customer. That, that's one of the key success factors. Um, uh, a second one is the agility, the ability to move quickly um, and and adapt. Um, I think COVID taught us a great example of that in the U.S. at least, and I think beyond our borders, um, what we saw in the early days of the shutdown was a disruption in the food supply. Um, and the reason is we have a really well advanced supply chain that optimized the, the production of food and getting it to the consumer. And the assumption of that supply chain was a large percent of the, of the food went through schools uh, that fed their children, went through, went through restaurants. And when the shutdown occurred and schools were shut and students stayed at home and, and restaurants closed down, uh, we ended up with shortages uh, in, in, this, in the supermarkets farmers not being able to get rid of their food and destroying food, um, even though it was needed elsewhere because the supply chain did not have the agility to react quickly and say, okay, the, the conditions have changed. We now have to shift the way we distribute the food from the farm to, to, the, to the consumer's um, uh, kitchen. Um, and and, and uh, so that agility turned out to be something that we've learned about. And again, companies that are starting to take the lessons of COVID seriously are, are understanding that they need to change the way they think about their, their operating model in terms of the supply chain and get that agility in place. Uh, a third uh, one we've talked about a number of times already, I won't go into it again, is cross-functional teams. The ability to get all parts of the organization to really uh, 
work together and to make sure that uh, their roles and, and shift appropriately so that they can co continue to cooperate in the new models. Uh, uh, the last, uh, second one, uh, the fourth one actually is the ex uh, going to external partnerships. What we've learned uh, time and time again is that no company is smart enough to know all of what it needs and to have access to all the, the skills and technology um, and having external partnerships uh, that partners that that have uh, access can give you access to uh, to these technologies is critical. So whether it's in your IT shop uh, to bring in competencies that you don't have uh, uh, the ability to quickly uh, train up your own people on, uh, and then a strategy to internalize the ones that become core competencies uh, or uh, partnerships in an R&D space. Um, uh, biotech companies uh, are now a key uh, partner to the large pharma companies who found that they couldn't do all the R&D internally they had to externalize it and build partnerships with, with R&D firms. Uh, and then finally, uh, the data proficiency. Uh, and this may be the most important one of all, because uh, as we've seen, uh, all of what we learn about uh, comes through the collection of data and the analysis of data. So to go back to Chandra's example, talking about the MIS reports coming from your ERP system or your CRM system or your financial systems, these typically are, are, are data produced in silos but the ability to cross correlate data from different parts of, of different systems, different parts of the company, understand uh, how they, they work together. Are they coherent? Um, what is it teaching you about uh, the, your behaviors as a company, your consumers and customers' behaviors? The ability to do that analytic, to, to look beyond your company and see what the world itself is going to in terms of what competitors are doing, that analytic proficiency is critical. And that's not simply a technology tool. It's, it's the mindset of, of your people. People need to be inquisitive. They need to ask questions and ask intelligent questions and then uh, to figure out where to get the answers. And, and you can perhaps, and this gets back to the or, earlier question about organization, the data analytic skills can be housed in some experts that really know how to pull data and, and, and massage the data, but they need to know what questions to ask. And the business people are the ones that need to really think about the questions and understand what is it we need to learn about and, and, and have sharper uh, uh, information, more clarity about, uh, and then they can work with the data uh, analytic professionals to get the answers. But these, again, are, are key skills that we've seen time and time again, that if you don't have these key skills, uh, you're just not going to be able to succeed. I think it's that critical that business people and the uh, data experts get together, really, you know, reach out to each other uh, and understand each other's uh, game, so to speak. Um, and then I think you described it very nicely. Hey guys, really good. We are seven minutes uh, before the end. That allows us to go and finish up with three questions, which I still want to get to. Um, so the first one is getting us all the way back to the productivity paradox that you started, which is Jean-Louis. I said uh, I'm going to get to your question, and I commit and I stick to it. To, to, I keep my promises. Um, he says, uh, could you uh, elaborate a bit deeper into this uh, into this paradigm? Uh, is this transferable at company level? Um, E.g., saying that digital tech spread um, overall does not contribute systematically to better productivity. It depends on how it's applied. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think that's a, a very interesting question. So I think, I think first of all, let, let me clarify this notion of productivity paradox. So I, I, it's important to understand it is that the slowdown is not in terms of the actual productivity but the growth in productivity. So effectively what is happening is, uh, although we are having more and more digital technologies, the growth rate of productivity is slowing down, which is where the paradox comes from. So it, it appears that digital technologies do improve productivity, but not at the rate that one would expect. Uh, and and that's, that's, that's part of the issue. Now, the, the, there is always a disconnect between what we observe at the macroeconomic level, which is what the productivity measures are typically measuring, because it's effectively the, 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 the productivity of firms at, 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 at an industry and macro level, as opposed to an individual firm. So when we draw it down to an individual firm, most firms don't necessarily manage productivity per se. What they're managing is profitability, i.e. you want to be a profitable organization, and in the process of doing that, what we're trying to do as, from a strategic perspective is to create differentiators, to create unique markets, and therefore uh, not enable our competitors to copy us, so to speak. And that's where the value add comes from. And I, I think back to Charles's point, it is important for firms to be able to understand this linkage between strategy, business models, and then back to operations, 
because by aligning them, that is where we are going to get the opportunity to transform, create that competitive advantage, create the differentiation, and therefore create the value added, which will eventually show up, I suppose, in the productivity at, uh, at the macroeconomic level, because effectively what is happening is firms are using these digital technologies to just improve the efficiency of existing business models rather than transforming them based on the matrix of new technologies that's becoming available. So I think that's where the connection between productivity and firm level decision making makes more comes, comes in. Yeah, and let me illustrate that with an example from the study. One of the companies we talked to is a, a publisher of, of textbooks. Um, and uh, as they looked at their business model and understood that with electronic textbooks, uh, you can, it, it's critical not just to replicate the book and, and just make it available online, but to really think about the book as a communication vehicle between professor and student, between teacher and student. Um, and to the, once you understand that and you start measuring productivity in terms of the effectiveness of learning, uh, and, and you understand that in fact, uh, by rethinking how to make textbooks uh, more dynamic to, to, to give more uh, graphics or, or, or just to do more customization tailoring, uh, so that the student and the, and the teacher can both accomplish. You, you fundamentally created productivity, but if you simply replace the book with an electronic version, you're not. Charles, I love that example. It really goes back to, to what's the job to be done, right? I mean, Kodak really collapsed because they never saw a future where people did not look at prints. Even when they started to embrace or ex adopt the digital technology, it was about helping people to select prints, not to see in the future where there were no prints anymore. Um, so, uh, so, so indeed, that, you know, ladder up your thinking for the opportunities. I think is huge. Let me get to the, the uh, final question. Sorry, Andre, I'm going to go and get to you separately on your specific question. Clotilde is asking a question which allows us to make some, you know, a final statement because we have three minutes left. The perspective on business model and operating model, you know, you know, congruency is very insightful. What's your view on the operating model between IT department and business? Um, who should own what and who should lead the digital transformation? Maybe if that, that, uh, that allows you to make a, a closing statement of one minute each. <laughs> yeah, let me take that first. Uh, yeah, as I tried to explain before, I, I don't think there's just one answer to this. I, I think um, the, the uh, companies can approach it differently, but you, you absolutely do need a partnership between IT and the business. Uh, the IT group needs to really understand the business and the business needs to have some IT uh, fluency to understand some of the opportunities coming from IT. Uh, and and uh, it, unless you have people on both sides really interested and curious about uh, the other half of, of, of what's going on uh, and can create that kind of dialogue, uh, you're not likely to succeed. So it, it's very much about about the, the, the fluency and the dialogue that occurs between Gender, the business and comment. And I, I yeah, but I just wanted to uh, reinforce what Charles has said. And one way to think about it is if we think about a business model as a complex system that has got many interacting parts that firms tend to optimize using their functions, their operating model, it's important to ensure that all the functions have two roles. One is to optimize their functions, let's say it's IT, but at the same time to jointly own the business model. So each function needs to jointly own this concept of a business model and only then can the business model actually evolve. And, and, and part of the problem with lots of organization is that ownership of the business model in, in, jointly across the function is somewhat lost. So therefore the focus is on the operational improvement of the functions as opposed to uh, enabling the transformation of the business model. So just to reinforce Charles's point, is the joint ownership that is important to enable such digital transformation. And that's a cultural artifact, that's a leadership issue, and that's the important bit for one, us to think about. One word that I want to close with is integration. Um, we are exactly at the hour. I want to thank you, Charles and Chander, for your um, uh, wise words uh, and, and insights. And we're all about actionable insights uh, by, for the Compass Board. Um, uh, uh, and I think you shared quite some of those. Um, here are some other things which are coming, upcoming webcasts. Keep looking at our website. Um, and we also have a podcast series which may be interesting for you. And that's for you, audience. I want to thank you all for your attention. Uh, you stayed online for the most part very nicely. Thank you. I hope you found it insightful. Keep the dialogue um, with us. If, if you were interested in, you know, look at the report. There's much more in there. Um, and I, I hope to uh, see you again at a future webcast by the conference board. Thank you very much, everybody. I wish you a good rest of day, afternoon, or evening. Thank you. Thanks. Take care.